This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. Here we go! Listening to the Emerald Flow Show on the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. Welcome to the fourth episode of the Emerald Flow Show. I'm Gerard Detroit here with Paul Walsh, and we're part of the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. You can find us on all major podcast apps. And if you are on Apple Music, uh, follow the show on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five star rating. And also, if you're so inclined and love the work you do, you can visit voicesofwrestling.com slash donate, where you can get links to uh, donation buttons for all of the podcasts on the network. There's no obligation, but any support would be greatly appreciated. And so to start off the show, uh, Paul, you had a big trip this weekend. Uh, where'd you go? I went to, well, I was about to say beautiful Oberhaus in Germany, but that would be a lie. <laughs> But it was a nice tour. It was some nice wrestling that I saw in uh, Oberhausen anyway, because I went to uh, Ambition 13 and Night 2 of uh, 16 Karat Gold, which actually <laughs> uh, was quite interesting because I went there like straight from Berlin on Saturday. So I left at like eight in the morning on a five hour train ride to Oberhausen. Pretty much checked in the hotel, went straight to Ambition. Uh, went back to the hotel to eat, then went back to 16 Carat, went to sleep, and then left at 10 a.m. for another five-hour train ride back to Berlin. <laughs> That's a real power trip there. Yeah, no, it, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I also, again, was reminded that uh, Deutsche Bahn is just actually, like, a lot of people like to kind of criticize it, but I actually kind of like taking them because it is just the most comfortable way to... Uh, the most comfortable way to travel. And actually, uh, one of the shows we're going to talk about later, the Zero One Corrigan, I actually partially watched that while on the train using the train Wi-Fi and it worked really, really well. So like, just think about that, that I was watching Zero One the day after the show aired on a train and you tell that one to someone from like five years ago and they wouldn't even believe you. Uh, well, on the trains here in Canada, uh, they... On the Wi-Fi, they um, they won't even let you like stream anything. <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually like to be fair. I actually, took two different types of like train companies there and back. So there, I took like Flix Train, which is like the new kind of private kind of train operator, and they use like old, pretty old trains, and they technically have Wi-Fi on them, but that Wi-Fi never ever works. And it's also like it's pretty much, and this is something that really only Europeans forget, but it's basically like taking Flix train is like, it's basically Ryanair, but as a train, like that's what it feels like. So it's cramped? It's cramped. The seats are like really uncomfortable. They also like the weird thing there as well was like, they also don't have plugs on every seat. 
which Deutsche Bahn now even has in like small regional trains where there's going to be like a USB port there so you can charge your phone. And they allegedly had like charging station or they allegedly had like plugs somewhere on the train, it said so at least on the book in the booklet, but I couldn't find any. So I'm sure they exist somewhere, but like there's probably only like five on the entire train. And also because they put in the, they, they didn't bother like changing the, the wagons around uh, and all seats are in the same direction. Everyone on the train had to go backwards for the entire journey. It was really annoying. So yeah, no, like they, it's obviously is a lot cheaper than Deutsche Bahn, but I'm also like, yeah, no, I think I'd rather just spend the extra money and actually be like, have like a restaurant in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the train as well, which is nice for like a five hour train, right? To have a restaurant where you can just like go and eat some stuff and everything. So yeah, but yeah, so that was the actual travel there, but, uh, so the actual shows as well. So as I said, so I watched two shows, I watched ambition and 16 carat, and I'm not going to like recap them at full because we're not a, a European wrestling podcast, but I think I just want to touch on like, kind of like the uh, Japan related, uh, things that happened on the shows as well. Because uh, in Ambition, uh, we had both Shikihiro Irie and uh, Fuminori Abe both participate I in the tournament. And I thought both of them did really, really well. And I think really the highlight there was uh, is that actually Irie and Abe faced off in a singles match as well. Gerard, do you actually know if, uh, I looked this up so I know, but like, do you actually know if Irie and Abe have actually faced each other before in a singles match? I would bet that if they have, it was in Germany. Uh, yeah, so that was actually, so actually at first I tried to find anything and didn't find anything in cage match that they had ever been in a singles match. But then I actually went to wrestling data and it actually turns out that Abe's debut match was against Iria in a singles match. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Uh, so that was a fun thing to, uh, to find out. But so obviously, uh, uh, Iri won that debut match of Abe, whereas in this case, actually, Abe won uh, uh, won the match against uh, Iri, and that was one hell of a match. Like, it wasn't super long, and so I didn't quite go, like, uh, like I didn't quite get to four stars with it, but it was just, like, it was just really hard hitting, and I know that there has been a gift floating around of uh, kind of Abe uh, just shoot punching Iri in the head, which was a spot that he did throughout the entire tournament. And Abe just responding to that with some shoot headbutts, which is a thing that he did for the entire tournament, including one just really nasty headbutt where Irie just had both of Abe's arms trapped and he just reared back and just full force just domed him right in the center of the head. Like I very much expected like either or both of them just to come up from that spot and just be gushing blood and somehow neither of them managed to get busted open from that uh, but both of them were just super stiff uh, throughout the entire tournament as well especially Irie, like he he just really laid everything in super heavily like he like really like put his body weight into like all of his slams and everything and they looked super nasty so i really loved him throughout this entire tournament and then so after Irie, uh, after abe beat Irie, uh that was actually the semi-final so then in the final, unfortunately, uh, Abe did not win, uh, where he lost against Bobby Guns, who is a WXW regular and former world champion as well. So Bobby Guns uh, wins the Ambition Tournament, and I actually really loved that match. That match was amazing. I think that's a match that you, that everyone kind of, if you can uh, go and find it, I think that's well worth your time. Uh, I actually went four stars on that match. Just another really hard hitting affair, just two great technicians uh, going at it as well. And uh, kind of the finishing sequence of that one was really great as well, where both guys just showed off like everything they can do. And Abe was definitely as a whole was like the MVP of that tournament as well. Uh, I like he just really showed why he is like one of the best wrestlers in Japan right now. Like that was really the thing I came away with after that tournament. Like Abe is so good. He's so, so good. And I just want him to like work all of the promotions even more than he already is. Uh, so I saw a tweet from a friend of the show. Al I think it was Alan for Al uh, saying that basically they now have this long running storyline where Iria keeps up coming up short. 
Um, do you see them eventually ever paying that off and him winning the tournament one year? Um, yeah, I mean, I could definitely say that. I mean, WXW generally is a promotion that actually does pretty well with long-term storytelling. Like, because they have like a bunch of stuff that they build up like for like a long time that they actually managed to pay off at exactly the, the right time as well. So, and they seem, and Eerie also seems to love, uh, wrestling in WXW as well. And like, if you've kind of like looked at the tweets that he's put out throughout the entire tournament, like he just w seems to just be like super happy every time he's there. Like he, I think he took a picture with a bunch of WXW wrestlers, like after he just arrived with just like the biggest grin you've ever seen on his face. And uh, like, I definitely think that if he can, like he's going to come back uh, next year as well. And I could definitely see him, uh, uh, winning this next year. So, yeah, I would be confident because actually Eerie as well, because uh, he actually did really well in the 16 carat as well. So on the next night, it was uh, 16 carat uh, night two. And Eerie uh, had a match pretty early on the card where he wrestled, uh, what, was his what was his name? Invictus, or Hector Invictus. Yes, Hector Invictus. Uh, who, uh, he seems like a pretty fun wrestler as well. Uh, not gonna lie, I'm not a super regular WXW viewers, viewer, but he seemed pretty fun as well. Uh, just a big, muscly guy. Uh, he did really, like, so it was like very much like a powerhouse against powerhouse match against Eerie. So just a lot of meat slapping, a lot of just big guys throwing each other around, which is always a ton of fun. Uh, and Eerie actually won that one and then advanced to the uh, semi-final as well, which, yeah, that's where he lost then on night three as well. So I could definitely see Eerie kind of like be a guy that factors big into both tournaments next year as well, if he chooses to come back uh, as well. Abe, unfortunately, did not have a match on night two uh, uh, on that 16 karat show. Uh, so I... Act so I, but he sat at the merch table. So I actually went over and had a quick chat with him. Uh, seems like he actually cleaned up pretty well on merch because I actually wanted to buy a shirt from him. But the only size he had left was double uh, XL, and yeah, that's not gonna work for me. <laughs> I was like, unfortunately, I was like, yeah, no, I I can't uh, buy a shirt from you. So I actually kind of I actually broke two of my uh, convictions because I am very much an anti mark pick person. And I am even more so an anti uh, autograph person, like completely. Like I really, really don't like autographs at all. And I find people that go autograph hunting very, very off-putting and weird generally. Uh, I actually, I have a, uh, I actually have a signed uh, Matt Blanky shirt that I bought back in Osaka because I really wanted a Matt Blanky shirt and I very nearly didn't buy it because it had like autographs on it. And I've been trying to wash out the autographs ever since I got the shirt. There's uh, autographs in, on it. Uh, I don't know because they're in Japanese. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, they're still kind of on there. I can, I can send you a picture of it. Maybe you can make it out who it is. But I've pretty much been trying to wash them out since then. Uh, but, yeah, so actually in this case, I actually did, I did get a mark pick with uh with abe because abe because i was like oh okay well then i guess i can't buy a shirt from you uh, that's too bad and he was like oh picture's okay though and i was like I, i'm not gonna argue with him here i'm just gonna take the picture now and then i was like i do kind of want to give him some money as well and i'm not like uh and unlike case low who just handed uh uh Ishii a tenor famously i still kind of a guy that believes in kind of the exchange of goods and services for money. So I was like, I do want to give you money, but I also kind of want something back for it. <laughs> so uh, I did actually buy an autograph picture of uh, Abe that I have lying behind me right now. It's actually from his, uh, in a relation as well to something we're talking about on the show, it's actually from his uh, zero one one junior title reign because he has both of the uh, titles uh, with him in that picture. Uh, so just two questions, I guess, in closing. One, mm -hmm. I think the biggest question of all, did Irie have the Gayora TV title with him? He did not, unfortunately. I was kind of very much hoping to see that. And uh, unfortunately, he never showed up at the merch table because I, otherwise I would have asked him uh, where the Gayora TV title is. So, uh, yeah, he didn't, unfortunately, not have that with him. But he also did not have any of the other two belts that he currently has. He also didn't have the... 
uh, 2AW Openweight title, and you also didn't have the OWE title, although I suppose that title isn't really a thing anymore, I guess. And uh, as someone that's not really uh, follows too much about the, I guess, Euro Grap scene, what's the diff? Like, why does it, they're both WW, WXW tournaments? Like, what's the difference between Ambition and 16 Carat? Yeah. So 16 Carat is more like your traditional kind of big uh, wrestling tournament, single elimination, where it's just you get like a lot of like outsiders in and everything like it's just like regular wrestling basically whereas ambition is a, supposed to be a lot more like a shoot style tournament so the crowd is kind of like much more in that way as well where uh obviously at the normal six and character and everything like there's a lot of chanting going on uh a lot of kind of like the songs kind of happen as well that you would see kind of in euro wrestling so it is a lot more like that in terms of atmosphere, whereas Ambition has a lot more like a quiet uh, atmosphere. Uh, it's like, I, I actually now know what it feels like to be in a clap crowd, basically. <laughs> so because that's basically all you really do at Ambition is you clap. Um, uh, you, uh, they, there are also no pins uh, in Ambition as well. The only way a match can end is by referee stoppage knockout uh tko and um and tap out and there's also a lot of quick matches as well like for example Erie's first round match against uh swedish wrestler ender kara was pretty much a squash and eerie like and that was when i really noticed how much more eerie is actually laying it in uh in this match because he destroyed ender kara just complete domination and just yeah he like it looked really like he, like I said, he just really laid him his body weight on his slams there and looked really, really heavy and everything. So I think that's really the difference. And if, if I would have to guess, uh, because Abe lost like in the first round, uh, in 16 carat, and I would, ha if I would have to guess that Abe's main reason for coming there, uh, was, uh, to be an ambition rather than to be in, uh, 16 carat, um, and in the past, they also have had kind of a lot of kind of uh, shoot style people uh, come over as well as well from Japan to to kind of participate in the tournament. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the. Yeah. Uh, actually, there's one more thing actually that is related to us as well, because as a surprise on uh, during that show as well is we actually had future Noah competitor Ninja Mac in action. He actually wasn't announced for the show. I didn't even really fully realize that he was actually there, but he was. Uh, because there was the secondary title in uh, WXW is the shotgun title. And the shotgun champion, Absolute Andy, got injured. So the title was vacated and they had a surprise match for the vacant belt. And so you had uh, Ace Romero versus Ninja Mac <laughs> for the shotgun title on night two. And it was actually won by Ninja Mac. And I was actually speculating whether or not he might be bringing the title to Noah. But unfortunately, he lost it on the very next night. So he will not be bringing the title with him to Noah. But yeah, I did get to see future Noah wrestler Ninja Mac live in action. It was an interesting match, I need to say, uh, I have to say. Like, Ninja Mac actually impressed me more in that match than he normally did, kind of wrestling in the US. Uh, so yeah, will be interesting to see because obviously, like, Ace Romero is a very big guy. So. Ninja Mac kind of had to get a little bit more creative on how to like get Ace from Mero down, basically. Uh, so I think he adjusted to that pretty well, wrestling a wrestling someone that is that much larger than him. So yeah, now I'm kind of a bit more curious about how his Noah run is going to go than I was beforehand. Awesome. Uh, that's a great report. Uh, so we'll move on from talking about the Zero One Junior Heavyweight Champion to Zero One itself. Paul, we're a zero one podcast now. Yes, goodbye, Noah. <laughs> we're a zero one podcast now. We're no, we're no longer going to be talking about any Noah. This is now. Wait, what would what would we have to rename it in that case? Ah, it still works. Whatever. <laughs> you know, Mitsuharu Misawa was on the first ever zero one show. Yeah, that's true. That is true. I, and I mean, Misawa was one of the first investors in DDT, right? So we'll just kick off Noah for zero one at DDT. But seriously, no, we're going to continue to uh, cover Noah. But we did say that from time to time, we will dip into other Japanese promotions. And with Zero One now doing their big shows on Wrestle Universe, why not? And we'll probably also uh, cover G1 
GDT Judgment, uh, because that also is going to feature the 30th anniversary of uh, uh, Junakiyama. So that would be something that we will probably be uh, covering as well. So um, on March 6th, uh, 01 had their 21st anniversary show, which was also Shinjiro Otani's 30th anniversary as a pro wrestler. Unfortunately, I guess he's injured uh, yeah. because he's been... Uh, just standing around, and I've seen, I've seen him on Ganbare shows, just standing around, not wrestling as well. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the injury is, but I kind of got the feeling that he will be back sooner. Just it seems the way that he was cutting promos and everything uh, on the show. But yeah, unfortunately, it must suck to miss your own anniversary show. But yeah, I, I really had that feeling as well. Like it's such a weird thing to have like your big third. Like it's also not, it's also not like just like a regular anniversary. Like if it's like I don't know, like your twenty eighth anniversary or whatever. It's like yeah, sure, who cares? But it's your thirtieth anniversary. Like that's really big. Like how many wrestlers can say that they've been wrestling for thirty years, and to having to miss that because of an injury? Yeah, that just has to kind of suck as well. I kind of felt weird as well to kind of have the show and not actually have him wrestle on it as well. Uh, 2022 is going to have a lot of 30 year anniversaries. Um, cause well, Akiyama and I think Takao Mori and Yuji Nagata and possibly Satoshi Kojima. I th think he might have debuted in 1992 as well. So, well, I mean, I just said not how many wrestlers can say that they get to 30 years, but apparently it's a lot. So, well, this year, 1992 <laughs> was a big year for debuts yeah. of a lot of famous uh, wrestlers in Japan. Uh, so we'll get a lot of hopefully some cool anniversary matches out of that this year. Uh, so we're at Cork and Hall, 483 fans. I guess that's not bad, not great either. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, I mean, it's zero one, so you have to kind of limit your expectations. But I mean, it is also a fact that they drew like straight up 300 people less than all Japan did like two weeks ago. So, like, obviously, I was never expecting Zero One to get to that level, but I mean, you did have Segura on top, so you would have maybe hoped that that maybe would have that they would have at least gotten to 500 people, maybe more than a bit more than that, maybe. But yeah, I mean, it is Zero One. Like, I mean, before the pandemic, like I saw Zero One. Like, obviously, wasn't like a big indie. Or whatever. They, I don't or even think they were be... breaking a thousand before the pandemic. It was like yeah. nine hundred. Yeah, 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 no, 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 definitely. But again, like they could have gotten to that. It's not like capacity restrictions was were in place that would have limited them limited them to that. But I also very much feel like they did fall off significantly during the pandemic as well. Where beforehand they were like above like something like a real Japan for me, they, and now they're kind of on the same level. They've also had a lot of departures too. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Like they lost a lot of guys. They also lost a lot of young guys as well. I think that's really hurting too. Well, they did better than Big Japan, which drew 252 this weekend. Oof. Oh shit! Wait, that, that, that's, they drew that's, 400 in Shinkiba. How did they draw 250 in Shorik? I, I don't know. I mean, the main event was a tag title match. That was like the only big match on the show. But yeah, I don't know. That's yeah, still that's... better than uh, 2AW. They were drawing like 300 people pre-pandemic to Cork and Hall. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so the opening match was Takuya Nomura defeated uh, Satsuki and Nagao in 7 minutes, 48 seconds with a crab hold. Um, pretty good opener. You could argue, though, this was a waste of Nomura, just putting him in like a match against a young boy. But I thought Nomura was great here, uh, sort of kicking the shit out of Nagao. And Nagao actually got a little more offense than I thought. And I think there's some potential there, although I think he's got a ways to go. But yeah, there's not much more to say about that than him just beating up the young boy. Yeah, no, I agree. I, agree. I also very much felt like, okay, so you get yourself like the former Big Japan strong champion on your show and you're putting him in the opener against the young boy. I mean, okay. Uh, uh, was fun though otherwise. And yeah, I mean, whatever. I mean, it's not, I, I don't know. It's, has Nomura regularly wrestled in Zero One before? I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, he's been there before, I think. But not like a regular or anything. Yeah. That's still still a weird decision, but like I mean, it's whatever. Uh our second match, uh Yasu Kubota and Hide Kubota uh went to a draw against Yuko Miyamoto and Super Tiger. That's a pretty random team right there. <laughs> 20 minute draw. Um it wasn't it had its moments. 
but it just went way too long. I thought it was dragging by the end. Yeah, absolutely. Like, there's no reason you need to have those two teams go to like a time limit draw. Like, just pick someone and like. I mean, I have a feeling that obviously the Super Tiger team, Super Tiger Miyamoto team, wasn't gonna drop. But I mean, you can have one of the Kabutos like drop a fall here. It's like yeah, not, like, there's that no matters. reason to check them. Yeah. Exactly. Like, there's no reason for them to go 20 minutes to a time limit draw. Like, it's not like both teams have to keep their heat here. Like, it's yeah, definitely. And like, it definitely felt like they, I don't know, like they had to fill time. So they were like, let's do a 20 minute draw on the second match on the show, and that's why they did it. Third match saw uh, Sugitaka Sato and Takumi Baba defeated Shoki Kitamura and Gente Hariki in 11 minutes and 18 seconds when uh, Baba pinned Hariki with the BB bomb, which is sort of like a modified power bomb type maneuver. Uh, I thought this was pretty good. A nice little tag sprint. Everyone looked good. And I thought, you know, this is sort of like the heart of uh, Zero One's young guys. And I thought they delivered. So I think there is... Well, if they can hold on to them, all, which is an issue in zero one, but there's something uh, brewing, I think, in zero one. Yeah, no, I I really like this match as well. I definitely thought this was one of the best matches on the entire show. Uh, just yeah, I mean, it was a very noticeable difference. I mean, coming off of the the previous match as well, where these guys just had a lot more fire as well. Like they had a lot more fire than like most people on the show, to be honest. So uh, that made that really enjoyable. I mean, we got a little bit rough at times, but again, like there's still some younger guys that need like a little bit of polish as well. Uh, I definitely with Takumi Baba, I was uh, very much uh, got a, a after the match. I got a bit of a uh, flashback to kind of the indie circuit to mid two thousands with. Uh, Takumi Baba using Linkin Park as his theme song. I was, I was like, wait a minute, is that what I think it is? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Someone else was using Linkin Park on some like smaller Japanese company, like not like recently, the last couple of months, I think I saw something, but I can't remember who it was, but that was funny. Uh, Especially okay. because he was using Faint as well, which is just the most 2000s indie song. That, like you're either going to have a wrestler on the show that uses it or you're going to have like a video package that uses it. And after the match, um, Baba called out Atsuki Aoyagi of All Japan and they showed a graphic of Aoyagi on the screen. So that's something that's probably actually going to happen. Uh, I don't know when because uh, it's maybe in Zero One itself. But yeah, that should be good. And although I would hope Aoyagi is going over because I think he's in an upward trajectory and they clearly have plans for him. Yeah, uh, I hope so as well. Uh, definitely should be a lot of fun. And I've actually kind of noticed that Aoyagi has been kind of getting a few more matches outside of all Japan as well. I mean, obviously, they're not going to send him on excursion like they cool. did with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, Saito, Saito brothers. Yeah. yeah, with the Saitos. Uh, so they're not going to do that, obviously. Uh, so maybe it's kind of supposed to be kind of an internal excursion in a way where he gets like a, to wrestle like a bit more outside of all Japan as well. So he can uh, like get exposure to like different styles as well. So that would be kind of a cool idea as well while he like still gets built up in all Japan for his eventual title win. Uh, great seems to like him. He's been on a lot of great shows. Although then I wonder if like Shima's in the back, like trying to like yes. figure out a way to steal him away from all Japan or something. Very much not a big fan of all Japan wrestlers being on uh, on shows with Shima because I very much have a feeling that he's just going to try and uh, get them away from all Japan because it's Shima. It's, he's a very wily man. <laughs> Uh, and in a preview of what we might be getting at the uh, Oda Ward Gym Show in All Japan, we had the Voodoo Murders Collide match. I'm not exactly sure what the exact storyline is of why they're feuding. But anyway, Taru and Shogun Akamoto defeated Chris Weiss and Yoshikazu Yokoyama in 11 minutes and 5 seconds with a backdrop suplex uh, from Akamoto on Yokoyama. Um, like Taru returned at on the New Year's Day show. And then because Vice and Yokoyama used to be in Voodoo Murders. And I guess they all now are. I'm not sure why. They're, maybe they're fighting over who really gets to call themselves Voodoo Murders. Anyway, this wasn't great. 
Um, there was a lot of um, Taru throwing powder and then Shogun Okamoto just standing around, barely trying to wrestle. Uh, there was a moment where like Vice was throwing um, them around, which was cool, but that was the highlight of the match. And there was some blood. Yokoyama bled. But yeah, this was not good at all. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the uh, Midnight Express was original Midnight Express. This was not. Uh, it's, yeah, it was just really boring. And I generally, like, I'm someone that can get really into, like, a good bloody brawl. And this was just kind of a brawl that also had... This was just a really bad, sloppy, boring brawl that also had some blood as well. And Shogun Okamoto is just one of the worst guys I've ever seen. Like, he's just really bad. I remember first time I saw him come out for a match, I was like, oh, this guy's probably going to be really good. Like, oh, he's like a former sumo wrestler. He has like, he had like good size originally. Now he's just like, just kind of a big Rat. top, basically. <laughs> uh, like, but at first he at least had like a little bit of like, was like in a little bit of a decent shape. Uh, and I was like, oh, he's gonna, be, he's probably gonna be good, or he's gonna like get really good when he like gets used to wrestling and everything. And he just never did, and he also never really seemed to try as well. And then his effort level just continuously like went down as he also like went down kind of the the ladder of like Japanese indie wrestling as well, where he just started wrestling in lower and lower promotions, and now he just just doesn't do nothing. He just does nothing. He just stands there. He doesn't even pretend that he cares. He's literally just there, like pay me like i'm not gonna bump i'm not gonna use any moves i'm just gonna stand here and look like shit yeah the funny thing is with x sumo guys they either get it and are awesome or they're just like absolutely horrible yeah no there, there's nothing in between either they're like all-time greats or they're just shogun okamoto next match uh masato tanaka defeated yoshiki inamura in 17 minutes and 22 seconds with the sliding d uh this was my match of the night Although I will say, I think I'd hype myself up way too much going into this because I was really excited by it. I thought it slightly underdelivered, and um, I think one of the issues was it was the match structure because Tanaka took a lot of the match, and but you know Inamura got like a good amount of offense in towards the latter half of the match. Although Tanaka never felt like he was in danger, and then just you know he. Did some big moves to finish off in Inamura. Like he did like a sliding D, superfly splash, another sliding D. But just, I don't know, Tanaka didn't really feel like danger. Didn't, I mean, Inamura looked like a beast, but not like, like he was like a real threat. So like I went like three and three quarters on the match. Like it was very good. It was the best match on the show, but it just slightly under delivered. And I think that had to do with the match structure. Yeah, I also, I, I liked it as well, but wasn't a great match to me. I thought Inamura looked a little bit better than you thought maybe he did. Like, I think he got some really good offense in uh, on Tanaka, and I think Tanaka also sold it really well. I kind of get why they still try to keep Tanaka looking strong, given that he is uh, going to challenge for the GHC uh, title. So I get it, and also why he had to win this match as well. I think this was like a nice... I have a feeling that this was actually a match that they actually had planned for last year as well, when uh, when Inamura was in the Fire Festival, uh, and he got injured and he had to pull out of it. So I think this was basically the make good for that one, where they really wanted to do that match in Zero One, and now they got to do it uh, on this show uh, instead of uh, in the Fire Festival. Um, yeah was ultimately somewhat inconsequential as well. Like, I don't think really anything more is going to come out of that. It was just a nice match to fill up the card. And it was probably, I mean, I'm kind of struggling to say what actually was the best match on this card because nothing was really great on the show. Uh, so I would say maybe this one or the, the young guy tag earlier probably was like the best show on the match because I didn't think the main event was that good. And next up, we had the NWA Intercontinental Tag Team title, the team of Takafumi, which is the former Gensaki uh, Tanaka in, in Wrestle 1, and Junya Matsunaga defeated Tomohiki Hashimoto and Gajo in 13 minutes and 52 seconds with uh, uh, Takafumi used the Ichi Senshin uh, submission on Gajo, which is like a an armbar thing. Uh, so uh, Hashimoto and Gajo losing their second defense, 
and uh, Takafumi and Matsunaga become the 46th champions. Um, I will say I think this match sort of uh, exceeded my expectations because I've seen the Hashimoto and Gajo match defend the uh, NWA Intercontinental Tag Team titles previously on the New Year's Day show. They uh, defended against the Kubota brothers, and that match wasn't great. Uh, this match was definitely better than that. I thought Takafumi and Masunaga looked pretty good, and they were really what the glue that sort of held the match together. And like I was saying earlier, I think it sort of bodes well for some of the young talent that's being cultivated in Zero One right now. So, you know, I would give this like, I don't know, like a three and a quarter, like good, but like, you know, Hashimoto and Gajo are sort of also limited, but they tried their hardest to get something out of them. Yeah, no, uh, it was a decent uh, tag match. Also felt like the... Uh, Felt like they were genuinely happy when they won as well. So I think that made it a really nice touch as well. Like it felt like it genuinely felt like a big deal to them to win these titles. So uh, felt like a really good moment, like something that like good achievement for their careers as well, especially if they're still kind of early in their careers as well. I guess it's a really nice, good like achievement to win the zero one tag titles as well. Uh, of the tag titles in Zero One, the NWE Intercontinental uh, tag titles. <laughs> sure. Um, so it, it is always kind of funny, like how many NWE titles are just like still floating around in the wider world of wrestling <laughs> and in which promotions they are at the moment. Well, these titles and uh, Zero One was in the NWA when these titles were created. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what happens with most NWA titles. It's just like promotions that used to be in the NWA that then leave the NWA, but then keep the NWA titles around and also never rename them as well. Like there's multiple Mexican promotions where that's the case, like a bunch of Japanese promotions or titles in Japan that like got there that way as well. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is just always kind of funny to see. Um, yeah, no, it, it was a decent match. Otherwise, don't really have much more to say on it. Then like, I don't really have much more to add than like what you already said as well. In our main event, Takashi Sugera defeated Takuya Sugawara in 28 minutes and 58 seconds with a front net lock, successfully defending the not the AWA World Heavyweight title uh, for the second time. Uh, actually, I thought this match sort of exceeded expectations except for the botched finish, which saw um, Sugawara go for a moonsault off the top rope but he just lands on Sugera's head <laughs> and then Sugera no solds it and just puts him in the front neck lock uh, for the referee stoppage. And after the match, you can see Sugera is like holding his head and he just looks like he got hit hard. And I wonder if his orbital bones. Okay. And everything like that. I'll give Sugawara credit. Like he worked hard here. I mean, but you know, he is ultimately a limited wrestler, arguably one of the most disappointing graduates ever from the dragon system. Because even there's like, you know, you know, all those other guys that are sort of on the indie scenes, like in your Torium on X, X classes and stuff like that, they're generally a lot better than um, Sugawara is. So it's sort of funny that he has some sort of prominence in, in, in Zero One is not in the grimiest indies, but he's not that good. But he tried here, so I thought it was decent. Yeah, uh, I wasn't really a big fan of this match. Like, as I said, Sugawara did work hard, but it really only goes so far for him. Like, I mean, yeah, he, he just is not very good at all. And he also, he just didn't feel on Segura's level. Like, I think that was my biggest kind of gripe with this match. Like, he never really felt like a guy that should be able to beat Segura. Like, Segura just felt just... He's just so much better than Sugawara. He's just such a, so much of a bigger star. And the match structure for me also, like, it never really felt like Sugawara was in much danger of losing the title against this guy. Because he's just, he's Sugawara. And like, he's, like, we know who he is. We know that he's, like, not, we know that he's not very good. We know that he's not really a star. And, like yeah, I just he looks like never could never. Really, yeah, he like he looks like yeah. It's zero one. It's not the super grimiest any, but he looks like a guy that should be on the grimiest any. Yeah, he he looked grimy even by zero one standards. <laughs> like he should be on the Dove Pro show. Well, no, actually, he's not attractive enough to be on Dove Pro. Um, Eighteen. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the kind of level of promotion that he should be in. Like like he actually still like even in this state he feels like he is like below zero one standards and he shouldn't be a guy that is like main eventing 
zero one shows like it's yeah no i just ne couldn't never get into it like the mad structure like yeah i mean Segura, like given that it is segura it is it generally would have like a higher floor basically because segura can just drag you to like a pretty decent match uh, kicking and screaming but like it very much was like very close to like what what i would consider to be like segura's floor for a match as well like it was decent but nothing special and i just was i never got into it like i was just straight up bored for the majority of it where i was just like okay let's let's just get on with it and like this guy's not gonna win like let's just wrap this up and let everyone just get on with the day and then you have like the actual challenger come out and i had a feeling that it was going to be otani and then otani did come out in the post match as well presume like i haven't seen a translation for the promo that otani cut on segura but i would very much presume that like otani is going to challenge for the belt next when he recovers from his injury that is the vibe that i got as well uh although i see segura retaining against otani really I because i would see otani as like one of the few guys in zero one that i would think could reasonably like beat beat him as well i guess it's either otani or tanaka i think it will just be tanaka again in a few more months right yeah like once the he's because tanaka is going to lose to fujita for the ghc title and then you know a few months later he can challenge again i don't know that's just how i see it uh because like i mean o otani i mean he's still really good but he seems to be sort of stepping back more like he's doing just like he was just doing comedy stuff in ganbare and and everything like that so i don't know if he's really like gonna want to do like a singles title reign again that's just the vibe i got yeah no that's true and i mean if they want to kind of establish zero one on wrestle universe probably makes sense to keep like a known commodity uh, like segura on top uh, or like a guy that is known to like people that are like regular wrestle universe or like cyber fight followers as well like they like unless they're like deeper into like japanese history which i guess most of them would be but like what makes more sense to keep like Segura on top for a while and then move it over to Tanaka, who is also familiar to people that use Wrestle Universe as well. So, yeah, I guess that it would make sense to, for him to retain. But at least with Otani, I think there's a chance that he could beat Segura, which I never got that feeling for this match. Right. And so, yeah, we didn't get, I mean, there was like a, you know, a few teases. I forgot to mention Sugitaka Sato came out after the NWA uh, tag title, intercontinental tag title match, but he didn't have Takumi Baba with him. So I don't know if, if they're going to be the team challenging or Sato is going to find a different partner. So that sets that up. Um, I would assume, I don't even know how many, Zero One's not even running barely any shows. So probably maybe the next core can they announce, maybe you can check their website. That might be on Wrestle Universe, but we didn't get any announcements or anything like that. Yeah. No, I definitely have a feeling that it will be because I think that might be the plan to just put all of the zero one Kurricans on Wrestle Universe going forward. I hope so. That it's fun. Yeah. yeah. We also, also had the debut of that superhero character whose name are already forgot. Astro Man. Astro Man, okay. Not boy man. <laughs> no, definitely not. I mean Astro Boy has grown up and he is now Astro Man, but it's not actually in any way related to Astro Boy. Don't it looks sue us. nothing like Astro Boy. Uh no. this guy's <laughs> like a I don't know, like he's like all like bright pink or purple. I can't remember. Like, he, but he and he looks sort of like a um, more like a Ultraman type character, sort of. I guess. Yeah. He's keeping with the Japanese theme, like armored and stuff like that. Why did he have a baseball bat with him? I don't know. <laughs> that was, was the thing that confused me. Like, he is our big superhero, and he beats people with a baseball bat. Yeah, okay. I mean. Like basically, there was like a couple of breaks in the show that were basically to like hawk stuff from sponsors and and whatever, um, because there was an earlier from what I could read from some of the translated tweets, there was that I think I can't remember one of the like second or third match, Otani came out and then this other woman came out who's apparently I think a member of the Diet, and they were talking about like the anti bullying program that Zero One is running, and then later on they have like Astro Man come out and do his thing. So this is just like you know, zero one having to promote itself because obviously it's a very small promotion that uh, recently lost a lot of wrestlers because it couldn't afford to pay them. So <laughs> now look, if, <clears throat> if Astro man is actually a sponsor character, then I have to say he does not hold a candle to the 
best sponsor character ever, Carbelito. Uh, we're going to have to get a Carbel Ito versus Astro Man match, I think. I would be very curious. I don't know if Astro Man will be able to catch Ito on his tope. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. All right. So uh, we will continue coverage uh, with Zero One whenever it pops up on Wrestle Universe. I think that's probably a good way to go because uh, yep. I'm not sure if these things are airing on Samurai either or anything like that. So also on – so the day before on March 5th, Noah held another – an innovation show at Yokohama Radiant Hall that aired on Wrestle Universe that drew 134 fans. That's in line with what the uh, N innovation shows have been drawing. Yokohama Radiant Hall is not even very big anyway. I don't even think during non-pandemic times you could get more than 250, 300 in there, I don't think. No, definitely it is a pretty small arena, so it's kind of perfect to run for a show like this. I don't think we need to go over this match by match, um, you know, because I, well, mm -hmm. in part because I don't want to review, have to review another super crazy match. <laughs> well, what stood out on this show to you, Paul? Uh, what what kind of stood out to me was kind of, because it was like the first time we saw Aleja, or now he's, I guess he's Alejandro again now that he is out of uh, Congo, uh, which to the people that might have only seen him in Noah was his name when he was in Wrestle 1. Uh, because he actually left Congo uh, on on one of the shows that happened before as well, when he protected his uh, brother from getting attacked by Congo in the post-match. So he is now uh, out of Congo, and he's teaming with his brother Kai Fujimura now. I did not realize they were brothers until that angle happened. So no, yeah, yeah, yeah Fujimura no. comes from Wrestle 1 too. Yeah, yeah, they're both they're both Wrestle One guys originally. Yeah, with Kai Fujimura, it's probably also not a thing that was well known because he, I think, made his debut like really shortly before the promotion died. Yeah. So yeah, like I mean, obviously, like he's gonna be a Noah guy now because yeah, he trained a little bit uh, at he trained a little bit with um, uh, with Wrestle One, but like he's gonna be a Noah guy going forward. And I could definitely see those guys like be a regular team now. Uh, so I think that's actually going to be pretty good. Uh, I think really the other uh, the other kind of thing that stood out for me on the show was the Inaba and Kiyomiya versus uh, Hidaka and Suzuki match. I think that was actually a ton of fun. I mean, that's not really surprising given like the four men that were in that match, but I think that was just a really nice, good, fun, like fast-paced match. Like obviously, like I was never really in doubt who was going to win the match either. But I think like they, you had four great workers in there. And so they gave you like a really good, nice, like quick match as well. Like that one went 15 minutes. So they also knew like who's like the good guys, like the good wrestlers in there. So they gave them a bit of time and they gave you a fun match in return. Yeah. I mean, I've enjoyed most of the, uh, and innovation shows and I agree with you. I thought that tag match was the best one, but like it sort of lost me because you've got a Nosawa versus Yohei match. Yeah. <laughs> that went 10 minutes. And then the Hayata Yoshinari Ogawa and Yuya Susumu versus uh, Harada Hao in Miyawaki. That went a little too long um, mm. given Hayata and Susumu were on the other side. Um, I thought, but you know. Yeah, no, the, the show definitely took a bit of a downturn after that match. But, After the you know, uh, Inaba Kiyomiya versus Los Perros match, yeah. But I think overall, like the N Innovation shows have been a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, I think Harada, well, the jumps and turns are still happening, but Harada's, I don't know if Harada's booking it, but he clearly has some sort of hand in the junior division. And I think that's starting to pay off. And it'll be interesting to see what happens with the show at Sumo Hall. Yeah, no, it, it def and I mean, I definitely have to say, I mean, as I said, there are like, like a lot of jumps happening right now, but it was, it did actually have quite a bit of stability for like a couple of months there. And now they're kind of going back to just everyone turning all the time. So, but hopefully this is just to like kind of get things set up for like the Sumo Hall show. And then we kind of have like a bit more like set kind of roster for now. And then they can build things up for the Sumo Hall show. Yeah, definitely. I be really interested to see what they think that they can main event sumo hall with uh basically based on that junior division right now yeah i'm really curious because i like to me like because we ha already have eight of us Sarada coming up uh on this weekend actually which to me that would be one of the bigger matches you can actually do because eight is like 
one of the biggest stars in that junior division, like just by virtue of him being a main eventer in the second biggest promotion in Japan. So yeah, I am actually curious as well, like who they actually think. Do you think it's possible it's Ogawa? I could see that. I mean, that would rule as well Harada versus Ogawa for the junior title. Uh, So I think that would be pretty good. Maybe they're going to bring in someone from the outside as well to challenge for the belt. I could maybe see that happen as well. Maybe Muto slims down to junior weight again and challenges for the junior belt. You know, that match that Muto did that against Kasayashi for the uh, PWF junior, that was in, what, 08, 09, maybe yeah. even later than that. That was actually not a bad match. But... No, that was really good. I actually I actually kind of liked junior Mut- Muto. I think that was a ton of fun. I also love that he just fully committed to the bit and just shoot slim down to get under the weight limit. Like, he actually did, like, a junior, like, battle royal as well around that time to show he's a junior. <laughs> All right, so we before we move on to a number of previews we've got and some of your questions and news, just a word from our sponsor, HelloFresh. So what is HelloFresh? Well, with HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh cuts back on time spent in the kitchen so you can spend it on all of the other things in your life with meals are ready in around 30 minutes or less plus quick and easy meals including 20 minute recipes and low prep and easy cleanup options provide an even faster route to putting food on the table and HelloFresh is 72 percent cheaper than a restaurant meal of the same quality Uh, this is something that sort of i get into these ruts get busy end up spending eating out a lot so you can save on average over 65 dollars per month when you order HelloFresh instead of grocery shopping that's more money to put forward to all the other things going on in life right now and of course you know prices are going up so you obviously want to keep sort of control over your spending right now um HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items to choose from every week, including veggie, calorie smart, family friendly, and gourmet options, providing plenty of variety. Recipes like hibachi sweet soy, bavette steak and shrimp bring restaurant quality meals right to your kitchen, while their white cheddar wonder burgers make it even easier for you to skip the takeout. Um, so you can take advantage of this special deal. You can go to HelloFresh.com slash VOW16 and use code VOW16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. So that's HelloFresh.com slash VOW16 and use the code VOW16 for up to 16 meat free meals and three free gifts. And don't forget HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. All right, so we have actually, this is going to be our last show before a couple of big shows from All Japan and NOAA. So there's a lot of previews and news to sort of set up uh, going into that. I guess the sort of the (laughs) big news of the week, though, is uh, Suwama has exiled Dan Tamara out of Evolution for teaming with Abdullah Kobayashi. Um, Rather strange. But, you know, we were talking, I think, last episode about sort of how stagnant Dan has been feeling. So this might actually open up uh, things for him because I suspect that this is going to lead to Jan challenging uh, Sato for the junior title at some point. I mean, you would hope so, but we also not on the podcast because we didn't have it then. But we also had that exact same conversation about when Yasuko Okada left Evolution and then he challenged Yoshitatsu, then he took uh he took a uh, what's his face when if i could why am i blanking on his name now uh, shima no 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 he took the hair from uh oh susumu oh no uh sega uh, okada sega tachibane yeah anyway, he took tachibana's hair then he challenged yoshitatsu for the Giora title and then he just became a complete jobber do i think the same thing will happen to dan well i hope not <laughs> but i also cannot rule that out either so, I mean, but there isn't really a good track record of kind of young wrestlers leaving Evolution and that really working out for them. Uh, and I mean, now also, like, what is Evolution now? Like, it's Suwama and Hikaru Sato. So it's a two-people faction now. So it's also kind of weird. Um, I mean, I hope that this is, like, the start for, like, bigger and better things. Uh, for 
then. Uh, but yeah, it definitely will be like something that we're obviously going to be tracking going forward. I'm just, I think I just somewhat still have like uh, just flashbacks to Okada leaving Evolution and being excited about that and what, and now it is now finally going to get a push and then that just completely fizzling out and him leaving the promotion within a year. Well, I think there's a couple of candidates to join Evolution. I mean, you got Ryo in a way. Um, and also don't forget about poor Ryomo Sukamoto, who's uh, recovering from ACL surgery. And even the Saitos could join. And not to mention... Oh, yeah, of course. That actually and, makes sense. And not to mention there's uh, Suwama's super rookie, Yuma Anzai, <laughs> who I think is going to be reporting to the dojo this spring. So he will probably join Evolution at some point when he did. So, yeah. So basically, Evolution is now just Suwama... Sato, and then just a rotating cast of rookies that get kicked out after a while. I think that's probably what we're going to get again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sure. Why not? I mean, there's worse ideas for uh, there's worse ideas for a uh, stable, I guess. Uh, and so um, the other thing that was announced uh, just a couple of hours before we recorded, um, Dragon Bane coming soon to Noah again because he was there in 2019. Uh, Dragon Bane from Mexico. He generally wrestles in IWRG, although he's also popped up in AAA a couple of times. And I think most infamously, he shot on uh, T-Hawk and, and uh, Al Lindemann in IWRG. Is that correct, I think? Yes, yes. That was uh, Canis Lupo and uh, Dragon Bane. Uh, yeah, <laughs> That's, it's going to be interesting. Um, uh, how that goes in Noah. I mean, obviously Noah doesn't have... He's been there before, so... Yeah, he has been there before, so like it should be fine. But he is also somewhat known as a bit of a kind of... He wants to do his stuff, like uh, when he has a match. I mean, it worked out last time he was in Noah, uh, but yeah, hopefully he can kind of keep his ego under control uh, when he is in Noah now. I guess maybe is he going to be in Los Perros de Mal de Japón then? Or... I would... Thinking that's him, I guess your Daga prediction was incorrect. Yeah. Was he in the original? I don't... Uh, was he in the original Los Perros then? Because I do distinctly remember... Well, uh, no, because he doesn't... That... I don't think he works in... Um, I mean, he's been in AAA, but he doesn't... He's not there that often. Look, let me look that up. What does Kate... No, he's not. No, he hasn't been in there. Uh, yeah, so... I distinctly remember Ata saying that, but... I don't know. But I... I uh, it's bringing in someone in from Mexico, someone fresh as well that hasn't been there uh, since the pandemic started, which is always great. Like that's really what we need in Japan right now is like some talent coming in from the outside and kind of freshen things up as well. And he is a good rest, like his ego put aside, because I think it, that's really the main thing that has kind of uh, kept him to kind of lower promotions as well and why he hasn't really wrestled in the bigger promotions in Mexico all that often. But he is genuinely a good wrestler. So if he can keep that under control, like I think his run Noah could be really good and he would be a really great addition to the junior division as well. Like I think that could be like a really fun thing for him to be in there and like he could really like uh, help kind of make the division better as well. So I'm I'm all in favor of that just on the face of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I suspect he'll probably be behaved. I mean, I don't know what the whole, like was there a whole story behind the whole shooting thing? I don't know. Um, so um, basically from what I remember, what happened is that they wanted to, to have, like they are kind of known to have kind of pretty hard hitting matches on the Mexican Indies. And so they were basically like, they know that like Shima and T-Hawk and like can do that style as well. And so that's the kind of style they, of match they wanted to have of them. So to have like this really kind of butchy butchy match. Um, but. Shima didn't want anything to do with that because Shima just wanted to do like his like touring match, just like a lot of like high speed, like high flying action, like taking it a bit easy as well. And like he just like wanted to have like he wanted to have the touring Shima match. Like if you've ever seen like the Shima touring match, you know exactly like the type of match that I'm talking about. And they just went like it was just a complete like lack of communication where like like Dragon Bane just kind of tried to kept forcing like T-Hawk and Shima into the type of match that he wanted to have like so much so that like he managed to piss them off and that's when like the shoot like the shooting started in the match so 
I was pretty much just a miscommunication, but it was also very much based on the fact that Dragon Bane was like, no, I want to have the match that I want to have, basically, and not like basically respecting kind of the wishes of the people that are like coming into like the promotion and everything and that. So, yeah. And, and, and this is also not the first time that something like this happened. Like they have like shot on people during matches before as well. So again, one of the reasons why they are kind of on the lower type of uh, like not lower, like not that IWG is like a bottom like promotion. Like it is one of the biggest like uh, Mexican Indies, but still it's the reason why he has only worked like select shots on AAA. Right. I think, yeah, I think he'll be fine in Noah though. Uh, yeah. Given that everything like that. I mean, having hard hitting matches that probably is not going to get you in trouble in Noah. Um, and so some other news uh, before we get into the previews, uh, we have two uh, match announcements on um, April 16th, uh, Cork and Hall show, which is the 60th anniversary of Cork and Hall. Uh, so some interpromotional action. First in that ma- uh, match that was announced is Suwama, Shotaro, <laughs> Ashino, and Dan Tamura still teaming with Suwama, uh, versus Haruki, Goto, Yoshihashi, and Yo of New Japan. Um, should be a, Could be a really good match, uh, yeah. actually. Um, but I think Dan is the fall guy in that one. Yes, <laughs> just look at that announcement, and it's the most obvious thing ever who is going to take the fall in a match. Yes, it's absolutely going to be Dan. I mean, I am curious in general how many of these matches All Japan is actually going to win, because I don't think it's going to be that many. And also announced for that show, uh, Yuma Aoyagi and his brother Atsuki Aoyagi team with Great Bash Heel, Togi Makabe, and Tomoaki Hanma to face Los Ingobernables de Japon team of Tetsuya Naito, Shingo Takagi, Romo Takahashi, and Bushi. Um, I could see Bushi being the fall guy, but considering they didn't have Bushi be the fall guy in the uh, Los Ingobernables versus Congo match, I could see Hanma being the fall guy of this match. I could also see Atsuki being the yep, fall guy as well. Very possible. Although I would hope all Japan is a little more yeah. protective of him given they clearly have plans, but it, that could happen. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he is still the fall guy whenever he teams with Yuma as well. So I, I would take, I mean, I would take a guess that he, like it's either him or Hanma. Like that, those are really the only two options here. Oh, uh, I think there is a chance that Bushi is the guy that takes the fall as well, but uh, for the most part, like I do, like I don't think Lij is going to be on the losing side here. I am looking forward though to see uh, Yuma Aoyagi and Naito face off because I don't think we're gonna see that too many times throughout either man's career. So I think those hopefully are gonna have some fun exchanges there as well. Yep, hopefully, but still no word about any more Taichi versus Yuma confrontations because if it's going to happen again it could be this year yeah i mean i i definitely like i hope that they pay that off at some point i don't know if either promotion actually has an interest in doing that but i think that would be like a really nice scalp for uh for yuma aoyagi to take and taichi is a push guy but he's not like a top guy so i don't think new japan would be like super protective with taichi and just a couple of other all japan notes ryuji hijikata and kaisuke ishii of ganbare uh, will have been announced to be on the March 27th show in Saitama and on the April 10th show in Shizuoka, which will be on the Champion Carnival Tour. Uh, that match, that show will have Sugi, Raicho, Hiroshi, Hiroshi Yamato, and the injurer of Naoya Nomura Hideki Sakin, or aka Shrek, who hasn't been in all Japan since that injury, and uh, now he's back. I mean, perfect moment for Nomura to return to all Japan and uh, get his revenge on Shrek, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's funny because he popped up in Noah as part of Segura Gun at one point, like early on in Segura's Gun run. But I d- think they stopped using him because he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I have, like I said, I have, I have actually seen him have one good match, and that was in a uh, hard hit against Hikaru Sato. Uh, that was actually that was actually a pretty fun match, but that's literally the only time I've ever seen him have a good match. And actually, when I actually saw that announcement pop up, I just saw Champion Carnival and I saw those names and I was like, "Wait, are these these guys going to be in a Champion Carnival?" And I saw like, "No, actually, that's just the announcement uh, for them uh, on the show." So hopefully, that means Shrek isn't going to be in a Champion Carnival because I was like, "Oh no!" When I saw that, I was like, "Is he going to be in a Champion Carnival?" But 
hopefully not and it's just that he's on the show okay so uh so get to our previews now on march 12th at corgan hall all japan has a corgan hall show i don't expect this to draw very well given this lineup uh We've got Rising Hayato versus Seiko Tashibana, Takao Omori and Black Mensa Ray versus Izanagi and Kikutaro, Tajiri versus Ryo Inoue, uh, which I'm strangely kind of interested in watching because Tajiri can do good matches against the young guys when it's just like all mat stuff. Uh, Yoshitatsu versus Kazuma Sakamoto, which I'm kind of surprised they're doing here and not at Oda Ward. But, um, and then another Triple Crown skirmish, Kento Miyahara. Yuma Aoyagi and Atsuki Aoyagi versus Suji Ishikawa, Kohei Sato, and Ren Ayabe of Just Tap Out. And uh, Suwamo Shitaro Ashino and Hakaru Sato versus Ryuki Honda, Koji Doi, and Kumarashi. And your main event uh, for the All Asia Tag Team title, Hokuto Omori and Yusuke Kodama versus the aforementioned team of Abdullah Kobayashi and Dan Tamara. Um, I don't know. Um, I'm assuming Omori and Kodama are going to retain, but I don't know, maybe because of this Tamara leaving evolution thing, does that, do you think that increases the chance of them winning? I mean, maybe, I mean, it also depends what actually happens with Sato uh, versus Omori as well. Yeah. Cause maybe they want to take the belt, the all age attack title. Like if Omori is beating Sato, then I guess maybe they don't, if they don't want to make him a double champion, they might uh, take the All Asia title uh, off of him here. And that would actually be kind of a fun team to have Kobayashi and Tamura actually carry those spells for a while. Like I think that also would be Tamura's like first title as well, right? Like I don't think he's yep. won anything. Yeah, he's won the Asanaro. Um, yeah, yeah, he won that one, and, and then he immediately <laughs> became like the, the least pushed of those guys that were in that tournament, pretty much. <laughs> Like he won that one, and then he hasn't really done anything since then. Whereas everyone just p blew past him. Yeah, they they got better than him, which was yeah. not less so at the time. I thought. No, but it was also like it became like, like because I think like like also like happened really fast because I remember like being like yeah Dan is clearly the best of these guys, and then like three months later I'm like oh everyone else is better than him. And I was yeah. like, how did that happen? <laughs> um, the only other thing I guess Yoshitatsu versus Kazuma could be. I think it could be good. You know, Cosmo's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, I hope he wins, Cosmo wins, because I just don't, what's the point of having him lose this early? Because I don't think this is just a temporary run. Because if this is just a short run of Cosmo coming in for like three, four matches, and this is just more Yoshitatsu vanity booking, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's not like that hasn't happened before in all Japan. Yeah, you know, it, it is always the most vexing part of all Japan is the is the keep Yoshitatsu happy campaign by like giving him like stuff to do that doesn't really factor in like if, like it's so like you know I actually you know what I actually have a good comparison now that uh, for like what the Yoshitatsu booking feels like because uh, it feels like uh, the way Cody Rhodes felt like the like the last little while before he left AEW but where he's hurts. just. Yes, there's the Tatsuverse. Like, it's completely unrelated to anything else that happens in a promotion. Like, he's off there doing his own stuff with his own people, and it doesn't have anything to do with anything else that happens in a promotion, and he's just never involved in anything big either. And, yeah, he's just off in the Tatsuverse doing Yoshi Tatsu things. Yeah, that could be a case. I hope it's not, though, because Kazuma would really inject some much-needed uh, freshness up. I mean, he is he is also like a member of Bulk Orchestra in great as well. So that also is like the thing where I'm like, I hope this is like a longer run, but I also wouldn't be surprised if like this is it as well. Right. Well, great doesn't run that many shows. I mean, it, you can book around the, that schedule, yeah. I think, to actually do programs with them. Yeah, uh, true. But that's again, like my thinking is like if, because I kind of want him to be in Champion Carnival, but I don't know how much that is going to be possible. Like, right. With his, should take a look at the great that. schedule. Yeah. Um, the only thing, other thing I'd say I'd watch out for, because on I guess it's now yesterday's show on March seventh, All Japan show in the main event, good main event was um, Yuma Aoyagi and Kento versus um, Twin Towers of Koi Sato and Shuji Ishikawa, and uh, Kento pinned Ishikawa with a Hurricane Rana. Uh, so I think that Ishikawa is going to pick up a direct win over Kento before. The Oda Ward Gym Show, 
because I don't think Ishikawa's winning at <laughs> Oda Ward. I hope not. Oh, God. <laughs> Even though Ishikawa's definitely better than he has been recently, I, he's improved again. I, he got back into better shape and everything and because uh, he was really looking like he was slowing down there for a while, but I you should not take the title off of Kento right now. I mean, we we don't really know what the plan was for like the Jake Lee title reign. Like it might have been the plan for Ishikawa to beat him at the Ota Ward show. And now they're just going to have him beat Kento instead. Like it would be a very bizarre choice. Like it's not what I would do, but yeah, I don't know. I, I like gun to my head. I'm saying Kento retains, but I also definitely cannot rule, rule it out that like they're going to put the title on Ishikawa for some reason. Well, I mean, if Shuji pins, pins Kento, like in one of these shows leading up to it, like on this Cork and Hall show, I would be a lot more like confident that Kento's retaining. I mean, it might also just be a show that like Kento is just better than Ishikawa now, where like that, where like that dynamic is basically reversed now, where he just beats him in all of the tags leading up to it, and then he just beats him in a title match, and that just like that just very clearly shows that like Shuji Ishikawa isn't like on Kento's level anymore, basically, where he just clearly dominates him now, and he's just very clearly like just that much better than him. That is some very uh, generous booking from. <laughs> <laughs> Look, one can have hope. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that's really all that I have to say about that show. So we move on to uh, Great Voyage 2022, which is at Yokohama Budokan on March 13th. The next day, we open the show with Kenya Okada versus Juta Miyawaka, uh, Naomichi Marafuji and Misaki Mochizuki versus uh, Kaido Kiyomiya in Daiki Inaba. Uh, and then in the. Oh, so. That's the first round of the GHC tag title tournament. Yep. And the other semifinal slash first round matches are Keno and Masakatsu Funaki versus Takashi, Takashi Sugiera and Hideki Suzuki. And then uh, Yasutaku Yano, Yoshinari Ogawa, and Hayata versus Tadasuke, Nia, and uh, Hajime Ohara. And then Hao, Alejandro, and Atsushi Katoge versus Super Crazy, Ikuto Hodaka, and Nosawa Rangai. Yohei versus Kataro Suzuki. Go Shiozaki versus Men Busoya, Kendo Kashin, uh, Kazushi Sakuraba, and Kazuyuki Fujita versus Masato Tanaka, Yoshiki Inamura, and Masa Kitamiya. And the GHC Junior ta- uh, title, sorry, junior title matches, Daisuke Harada versus Aita, Aita. And the main event will be the GHC Heavyweight Tag Title Finals. So, who, Paul, who do you think walks away with those tag titles? I'm not going to change my previous prediction. I'm going to stick with Hideki Suzuki and Takashi Segura. Yeah, I'm sticking with that as well. Yeah. I don't think anything's changed. Now, more interesting question is, do you think Ada wins here? <sighs> maybe. I mean, because maybe maybe it is, that is the Sumo Hall title match, but you have Ada going into it as champion. I could see that happen. I mean, Ada is like, Ada is a big star. Like I said, Ada is a genuine star. Like he is a main eventer in Dragon Gate. Uh, he, if you want to draw in that Sumo Hall show, he at the very least has to be in a prominent position. Uh, and what more prominent position than maybe having a rematch between him and Harada for the belt where he, Harada regains the belt there. So I could definitely see Ata winning. I, if I would have to take a guess, I would still think that Harada retains though. Like, it's just a gut feeling. Like, for some reason, it doesn't really feel like Ata's going to win here. But this is really more of a gut feeling than anything else. But I wouldn't be shocked uh, if Ata wins. And I actually would like it if Ata wins as well. I think Ata could have some really fun uh, defenses with this belt. Uh, and I think it would instantly kind of become my favorite belt in the promotion as well, uh, if he wins wins it as well. Because I, I love Ata. I think Ata's great. Um, so... I definitely, I think he could win. Yeah, I think he could win too. It just seems like the whole fanfare of him being brought in and everything just seems like uh, built for him to win that title. It would be a big uh, win for whoever eventually uh, takes it from him as well. Um, but I I don't know. Do you think they'd go right back and do Harada versus Ada again at Sumo Hall that soon? I, I could see. I could see it because like, yeah, yeah, then he put it on Ada. I mean... I mean, here's the thing, actually. If they put it on Ata, I actually have, now that I think about it, who is someone that has been getting a ton of June, that has been getting a lot of, a ton of singles matches recently and has been winning all of them in the junior division? 
that might be actually the next challenger for the junior belt. There's someone that I have in mind there. I don't know if you have the same person in mind. That Kotoge? Is Kotoge, yeah. Kotoge has been getting a ton of singles matches recently, and he's been winning all of them. So I could actually see him be the challenger uh, on the Sumo Hall show because why That's else is he getting all of these? Why, yeah, why else is he getting all of these uh, wins? And again, that works with either Harada or Ata. Because you could have Harada versus Kotoge as the junior title match, or you could have uh, Eita versus Kotoge uh, trying to kind of avenge the title loss of his uh, tag team partner, or you can have the uh, Momono Station tag uh, singles match as well. So I think either of those are actually pretty good options for the Sumo Hall. So, yeah, so the more I actually think about it, the more I'm actually kind of talking myself into that being kind of the, the match there. And now the final two big shows that will happen uh, b- before we record again do not have full cards. On the 21st, All Japan and Noah both have big shows. All Japan returns to Oda Ward Gym for Champion Night, Champions Night 3. And so far, all we have announced is Shitaro Shino versus Ryuki Honda, Yuma Aoyagi, Eski Aoyagi, and Rising Hayato versus Tetsumi Fujinami, Mitsuya Nagai, and Leona. Uh, and then Voodoo Murders versus Total Eclipse. <laughs> Suwama, Taru, Shuji Kana, Kondo, Kono, that's Masayuki Kono, and Toshizo, or Toshizo, which is Ryuji Hijikata versus Jake Lee, Tajiri, Koji Doi, Kuma Arashi, and Yusuke Kodama. Uh, we have uh, Hakaru Sado versus Hokuto Omori for the PWF Junior Heavyweight title and the main event for the Triple Crown, Kanto Miyahara versus Suji Shikawa. Paul, what do you think of that Voodoo Murders match? <laughs> Finally, Voodoo Murderers are going to show Total Eclipse what real heels are like. <laughs> basically, being the cent- like that's basically what that match is built around. So I, yeah. I am incredibly curious how this one is going to go. Because <laughs> there's so many different out. Like, I would, it would make the most sense for Total Eclipse to win here, but. They should. Really. It, they should, but. I have a feeling they won't. <laughs> I have a really strong feeling they won't. I have a really strong feeling Voodoo Murderers are going to win this somehow. And just, I was, I want maximum chaos. I actually want Taro to pin Jake Lee. Just <laughs> as the most, like, what the fuck booking decision possible. Like, just Jake Lee gets powder thrown in his face and then rolled up by Taro for the win. <laughs> well, it is a Jake Lee return match, so you can get away yes, and perfect. take the fall. Perfect. He returns just after being triple crown champion and gets beaten by Taru. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, you could, to be fair, you could actually turn that into a storyline where that actually then leads him to him getting kicked out of Total Eclipse because he just got beaten by Taru. Yeah. It feels like that might happen. I, I don't know. I'm 50 50 on that, but this, they're certainly setting things up for that. Like that could conceivably happen. And I would assume Honda would become the new leader, right? Yeah, I mean, Honda would make the most sense because, like... But Honda's probably going to lose yeah. on the show. <sighs> I mean, does he, though? Because he is against... I mean, you would think so because Ashino's a champion, but it's also Ashino. Right, but it's. I think this is, like, the tit-for-tat win after losing to Honda in the uh, Triple Crown tournament. That would be very logical, yes. <laughs> However, again, like, if you do want to make Honda the lead of, to- lead of Total Eclipse, you also can't have him lose here. Yeah. So, I mean, but again, that's us assuming that he becomes the leader of Total Eclipse. I'm not sure if they're And we're also assuming that that happens right away. Like, it might also be that they're actually, like, teasing that storyline out for a little bit longer as well. And, like, they're going to do that turn, like, in, like, a couple of months as well. Like, they don't necessarily have to do it here. Like, they can do that a little while later. And then it doesn't matter that he lost against Ashino. I think all the angles will come out of the carnival and not right before them. I yeah, think. that's true. Um, so it might make more sense that, like, like everything happens after carnival and then it doesn't matter that like what the result of this match is and then it makes sense for Ashina to win. Um other than that, I assume Saddle will retain over Omori. Uh I think that's the I most likely. I not so super sure to be honest. Like because Omori to me, like he's been good for like a really long time and it's very clear that all Japan like really likes Omori because he is also never taking he is never getting pinned. Like like the moment he like joined on Fan Cerebris, he has been like very protected. Like he was still a younger then, and even then he wasn't taking very many falls, and he is taking even less falls now. So I would not be surprised if he wins this. 
I, I, yeah, well, with the junior title, you can never, you know, yeah. say for sure. I just have the feeling Sato is going to get a bit of a, my prediction is Sato gets a, an actual like extended run and then loses to Aoyagi at, at ski. That's just, no, I, I think whoever, like, to be fair, like whoever like wins this match to me, like, yeah, it's losing against Aoyagi at the uh, anniversary show. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could do the generational rival thing with Omori yeah. versus Aoyagi. Exactly. Even though I thought that was going to be Dan, I thought it was it's going to be yeah. Dan and Omori. But no, it's actually Aoyagi and Omori. It's like, ah, well, I mean, it's still going to be good, though. Like, I think regardless of what that match, like, I think that match is also going to be really good, though, Omori against Sato. Oh, yeah, I really like their their match during the last year's Junior Battle of Glory. It was great. And I think... Well, I personally, what should happen is Yuma pins Leona in the in the sort of All Japan versus D- tradition six man. Oh yeah, no, I mean that's oh. kind of without a doubt. Like <laughs> Leona's taking that fall. That's another so. one that is really obvious. I mean, it could be time. Hayato. Could be, but if I had to make a ranking of wrestlers, I'm putting Leona below Rising Hayato. Yeah. So yeah, and also you like you do still like you want to protect like. Like Yuma needs to get some wins as well. So sure. I think it's very easy booking here to just have Leona get beaten. And like, we already talked yeah. about the triple crown. And then this is going to happen before um, we record again, which is for Noah uh, is uh, Great Voyage 2022 in Fukuoka. And the only matches announced on that show so far are Kazuyuki Fujita versus Masato Tanaka for the GHC title and the junior tag uh, GAC Junior Jet Tag Title Match, Katoga and Yohei versus Nosawa and Suzuki. Um, that's interesting. Uh, and that could be good, or it could just go off the rails if there's like bullshit in it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, those kind of matches are always kind of hard to estimate for Noah as well. So generally, I would hope that it's going to be good. But yeah, I ha- don't really have a good feeling for that match, if I'm being honest. I'm going to just look at them and I was like, yeah, I want that to be good, but I don't know. I have a feeling it won't be. And then Fujita versus Tanaka, obviously <laughs> Fujita wins here. It'll probably be a pretty good match. Mm-hmm. They'll just hit each other really hard and and Fujita will power bomb Tanaka and like lackadaisically <laughs> pin him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I've said before, I'm looking forward to, I'm actually looking forward to this match because I can that match I can just kind of go sit back and enjoy and not think about anything else because it's like it doesn't matter if Fujita beats Tanaka like who cares uh, and it's not gonna have like any major like implications down the line like like Tanaka's going to be fine and like it's not gonna change anything about Fujita so I'm just gonna be able to like sit there just enjoy the match uh, for what it is and obviously Fujita's gonna win like I think there's a near zero percent chance that Tanaka wins the title here. I know it's Noah. I know it does weird booking sometimes, but like, no. I also doubt that Fujita is actually willing to lose to Tanaka, which that's like an additional factor that plays into it here. So, uh, yeah, I it, I can just kind of sit back, enjoy, just see Tanaka bump around for Fujita and, yeah, then get power bumped into oblivion and pinned. Right. So we move on to questions that we asked on the Discord and on Twitter. First question from Twitter uh, Dr. Jonathan Foy, who is the author of the book Ganbaru, How All Japan uh, Survived the Split of 2000, which is now out in paperback. I reviewed the book for VoicesOfWrestling.com. It's a really good book. If you're not familiar with it, you will learn with the story of the Noah split from All Japan. You will learn a lot of things. Um, and so Dr. Foy asks, uh, after Nakajima's title loss and untimely injury, uh, people are talking about on Twitter saying that he should jump to another promotion. If you could decide his next move, should Nakajima stay or should he go? And if so, where? Uh, he should stay because, yep. I mean, there's nowhere else for him to go, really. Um, I mean, he's not going to get pushed the way he is. Well, I mean, he's still a top guy in Noah, all things considered with the booking. He's not going to get that in New Japan. And he... Uh, is not on good terms with the ace of all Japan. <laughs> and uh, even though that would be a huge money match, he should just stay put. Yeah, no, I agree. Like, like I think he should stay and uh, he's still going to get pushed. And yeah, so that there, there isn't really a place for him to go. That makes sense. Uh, I mean, new Japan, Hey, maybe you could freshen it up there, but he's not going to be like pushed as a top guy uh, in new Japan. 
Like he had, did have a fun G1 run a couple of years back, so would be His great. His style is also very that. different than uh, yeah. New Japan. What New Japan is doing right now, yeah. So like, I don't think he would mix really well with that so one. Like you could you could counterpose that to what Shingo's accomplished, but that Shingo style obviously fits in a lot better. Yeah, yeah, and like. Like the only match that I would see like is like him versus Shibata. That would actually be really fun. But then again, it's not sure if Shibata is actually like a wrestler again or not, because he just hasn't done anything since Wrestle Kingdom, which is curious. Uh, well, not well. I guess he wasn't on the anniversary show. Yeah, which is kind of surprising. Well, yeah. yeah, maybe they're saving him for like the thirty dome shows that they're going to run this year. <laughs> yeah, no, and I mean, like otherwise, for Nakajima, yeah, obviously, he's not going to all Japan because. That is actually going to end up in a shoot with, between him and Kento. Well, and also, you know, like that's a step down too. Yeah, yeah, it's a step down. Like all Japan is going to probably. I mean, I think they have room to grow if they can get things in order. But there's only so far they're going to grow without corporate backing yeah. or corporate yeah. ownership, I should say. Yeah, he's not going to go to Dragon Gate because he doesn't. What I'm trying to say is, I would like a Japanese Tony Khan. Yes, who grew up watching uh, like all Japan on NTV to buy the or company. Tony Khan himself. Look, he just added ROH, so he can just add a Japanese promotion on you top know, of that. I don't well. think his booking rhythms really fit into Japanese wrestling. You can just really tell, right? Oh, he also can't really do book free promotions. He's going to burn oh, no. himself up, and I'm sure he's not going to do free. No, but like, I mean, I think there's people that thought AEW was going to be like more sports based than it ended up being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Like, that's not going to, but like, yeah, someone like him, like that, yeah. Some guy that grew up watching Misawa on TV, and now he's just gonna be like, "I wanna, I wanna buy all Japan." That, that actually would be. I mean, there's cool. there's yeah. like a bunch of tech companies that probably might be in the market for a pro wrestling company if uh, all goes well uh, with uh, mm -hmm. the cyber fight thing. Yeah, I could see that. No, yeah, yeah, if if that is actually a success and people see that happening, then we might get some copycats from that as well. So hopefully, they're also as hands off as cyber fight has been as well. Just pretty much just like. Here's money, produce shows for us now. So hopefully, uh, if that ever happens to all Japan, it's kind of going to be in a similar vein as well. And yeah, otherwise, like, I mean, in theory, Nakajima could kind of switch sides on the cyber fight kind of divide, basically, and go to DDT. Like, that would be, like, the most logical thing. But again, yeah, I don't know if that's a really good fit either. Although that could lead to some really fun matches with him against Takeshita and Endo and like maybe like Akiyama as well and uh, Ueno, like like that would be one. But I also like that that hasn't really happened. Like there hasn't really been anyone that has like jumped from DDT to Noah from Noah to DDT. So he well, would you, be the there's first DDT one. guys getting sent down to Ganbare. Is what yeah, I'm exactly. Thinking. So. Yeah, like if if he would leave Noah, like I could really only see him go to DDT. But again, it's not something that they've done before. So I I think he will stay put. And we got Patrick from Twitter at Shut Up Patrick. Your dream carnival lineup for this year? I would say people that I would like to see: uh, Kengo Mashimo, Ayato Yoshida, um, Toa Iwasaki. Uh, Hideyoshi Kamatani, uh, who was supposed to be in the 2020 version, I think he would be a great uh, name for the carnival. Basically, you know, I'm trying to like come up with reason, like somewhat realistic like guys on the indies from mm -hmm. like Big Japan or 2AW that could be in it. Uh, I think that would be ideal, just yeah. realistically speaking. Like maybe like other people that I actually would like to see in there as well is like, I mean, Eerie, I think, is a very likely candidate to be in there anyway, hopefully. So I think that would be a great addition. Uh, hopefully, Kazma is going to, but maybe someone else from Great is going to be in it as well. Like I think Kawakami actually would be a cool addition to the Champion Carnival. Would be cool. Uh, yeah, Hayato Tamura. Yeah, Hay uh, Hayato Tamura actually, that would be a really good one. What do you they think? They want to like give him some seasoning. Yeah. What do you think of Takanori Ito being in the Carnival? Oh yeah, I love Ito. I've always been. I've been a fan of Ito ever since his result title run back in Wrestle One. So I think he would be like a really cool addition as well. Like I think that would be a bit of an eye opener for some people as well on him too. I think if Ito was in it I, more so than Kawakami and maybe even Tamara, I think he would have to be. I think he would be the most protected of any of the great guys. You would think so. Yeah. Because I don't know. I I got the vibe that they clearly like see him as like the top guy at some point. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I would love him for him to be like pushed all pushed that hard because I think he's great. Uh, but I mean, Tamura to me is like the guy that is very clearly like the the guy that they're trying to like make the top guy and like them trying to make him the top heel in the promotion right now. Like he was in the G Rex finals. Like he's just been like really prominently featured like ever since the promotion started. But like I think all three of those like bulk orchestra guy, like any one of them, I think would be a great addition to the Champion well, Carnival. Sure. Like except I think maybe like Quiet Storm. Yeah. Yeah, except for quite, well, I mean, I, I mean, I, that would definitely be the most disappointing, but I mean, he can have decent matches, but like, yeah, also, I would literally have, have, you can also have him have two points too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's that definitely, uh, uh, like everyone, anyone else from that faction, I'd rather have in a tournament. And then in terms of like big Japan involvement, uh, I would actually love to see Takuya Nomura. Yep. I think that He's- would be awesome. He has worked all Japan before, but it's very rarely compared to some of the other guys in the company. So I don't know if he's for it, but I would love to see him in it. Yeah. He doesn't and, hold many titles yeah. currently, I don't think. Yeah, and I would also love to see Abe in it, but I don't know if all Japan would see Abe as a heavyweight. So, they don't. So. Yeah, because yeah, in the past he's worked there as a junior, but I think that would be a great addition to the tournament as well. But Again, I'm also just coming off of a weekend of seeing great ABBA matches. So I might be slightly biased there right now. <laughs> okay, and from Droman, uh, your thoughts on the All Japan, New Japan six-man, and if you think others might step through the on the other side, you know, like a Taichi Yuma rematch, for example. We already sort of touched on that. It could happen, but it doesn't seem like it could happen this year, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. I think the six-man will be great. And frankly, the only other person that I really want to see step through the other side or the forbidden door or whatever you want to call it, Tanahashi is really my top choice in terms of someone who who could, like can do stuff because he doesn't have a title. He's not being pushed big time in New Japan right now, so he can do other things. Yeah, no, uh, I, I would love to see a bit more Tanahashi uh, as well. I could definitely see him maybe being on the uh big anniversary show uh on the 50th anniversary show so i think there's a chance uh that he is going to be on that one um otherwise like the one that i would see well uh it's no big secret that i'm a very big okada mark so that is one of the like least likely ones obviously uh, to appear in all japan but I just want to see, like, even if it's in like a six man, I just want to see Okada and Kento face off, if even just for a little bit, just for one sequence in a six man tag match. That's really all I want. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of like th- that um, tag match from that giant Baba memorial show from 2019, I think, where you got the Tanahashi and Kento interactions and they were awesome and it's yeah. like gave me goosebumps and everything like that. So. Yeah, it would be cool if even if they just are in a multi-man tag just for a couple of minutes. And finally, from Rika Tatsumi on the Discord. Yes, that Rika. No, <laughs> no, not that Rika Tatsumi. But Rika Tatsumi really has a lot of time writing uh, on the Voice yeah. of Wrestling so, Discord. Uh, like Rika was asking who should be uh, Fujita's first challenger, although they missed that Tanaka um, had come out after the show although i included this question because i think it brings up an interesting question is well this this rain is going to be lasting a little longer and uh my feelings on this is you want to give fujita challengers that are not going to permanently damage <laughs> young and upcoming talent uh i think people that you could put against fujita that's not going to be do much damage masa Kitamiya, even mara yeah. fuji maybe mara fuji um, is actually my guess as well because he has that singles match with soya yeah, Soya, even. So yeah, so yeah, it's actually good. Yeah, let's yeah, let's put him. Let's put him in. Hit each other hard. Yeah. Um, but I would keep Kaido away from Fujita. I would keep even keep Inamura away from Ch- Fujita, even though they're still beating him a lot. Just anyone young, keep away from Fu- Fujita and just put older talent against him. Yeah, or talent like Kitamiya, because you know Kitamiya is never going to win the GHC title and is going to be the good challenger every so often and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. I, basically, I, that's how I hope they handle this Fujita rain, but God knows what will end up happening. Yeah, I wouldn't be too. Uh, I wouldn't be too optimistic that he's not going to be able to like squash any uh, like young guys uh, during this rain. Like, I think we we just have to accept that it's going to be at least uh, 
one of them, uh, maybe multiple of them. But yeah, generally, like I would definitely like to see him against like all the guys like Maru Fuji and everything, uh, because hopefully he has maybe has a little bit more respect for these guys. So like it reigns in some of his worst instincts as well. Because if when he's able to like rein in his worst instincts, he can actually have really fun matches. So uh, like that's also one of the reasons why I hope they're going to be doing that a little bit more than like uh, feed like a collection of young guys to him. All right, so that's everything for this week. Paul, do you have any closing thoughts on uh, what we talked about today? Uh, not that much. I mean, it wasn't really a week where, like, I mean, it seemed like a week where didn't really a lot happen, but we did actually have still, like, a decent amount of stuff to talk about. But I think we're getting into, like, a really exciting period kind of for both promotions. And obviously, we have the Champion Carnival coming up very soon as well. And I think that's going to be, like, a really a lot of fun this year. And then hopefully that kind of coincides kind of with restrictions easing up a lot more in Japan as well. And we might actually get to see at least, like, if we if even if we don't get crowds that can make noise again we will at least like get like bigger crowds again so uh that will be like better to that will also be like great to like see like a full curriculum again rather than like this like half empty building that we've been seeing for the past two years yeah and uh just i guess pertaining to the champion carnival i would assume that the lineup will either be announced on that cork and hall show because that just seems like a very random cork and hall show that doesn't mm-hmm. have much to it. So maybe the carnival participants are there or on the 21st at Champions Night 3. But it'll be one of those two shows. Yeah, so definitely. It, it, like, like, otherwise, exactly you're running out of time yeah. to announce it. And the yeah, tickets yeah. are on sale. So I actually have a feeling that it's going to happen on this Cork and just because you got tickets to sell. Yeah, like, like I said before, like my feeling is really that they've waited so long this year is because they want to make sure, like there's, there's some visa stuff going on in, in there, I think where they want to make sure that like they're actually bringing in people from outside of Japan and they want to make sure that the visas process in time. Well, Paul, if you've read the headlines, you know that uh, Cody Rhodes uh, negotiations with WWE <laughs> seem to have come to a standstill. Yeah. Yeah. So it could be in the champion carnival. <laughs> uh, what will happen when the Cody verse and the tattoo verse collide? Uh, that would be, it would be, it would be curious. <laughs> Yoshita, has that match happened to WWE? I think so. Probably, it probably has. Uh, would that happen in was cody in ecw no no i don't know has Casma versus cody happened in wwe that's, that's a curious. also possible yeah anyway <laughs> i will go uh, it would be a very different very, like even more than yoshitatsu versus cody Casma versus cody now would be a very different match than it probably would have been back then when both went WWE. Oh, yeah because <laughs> yeah Casma yeah, was not good at that time so, okay. Well, for uh, Paul Vosh, I'm Gerard Trill, and we'll talk to you in two weeks.